for accommodating the time. I understand it is not your usual time slot. And uh, I am delighted to be able to speak at this colloquium. And uh, what I'm trying to bring to you today is a topic that sometimes sounds uh, rather scary, although half of the audience is more expert than me on this, but maybe not everyone is. And uh, so I wanna talk about higher category theory and I want to um, explain and maybe uh, acknowledge that uh, a lot of higher structures occur naturally in examples that, uh, that can be of interest. And just to have a little trailer of what the talk is going to be about, a little conceptual map, on the left-hand side of this chart, we have a more classical side uh, that corresponds to category theory. So this would be the study of ordinary categories. And by contrast, uh, I'm hoping to move or I'm hoping to stress what changes when we go to at least one flavor of higher category theory. And the one I mean is the study of infinity categories. Now, secretly, there is one extra parameter hidden in here in the sense that infinity categories are also known as infinity one categories and they generalize uh, strict one categories. And if you wanted to feel particularly brave and investigate more in the area, you could also uh, take interest in studying infinity n categories for a more general n, which are a weaker generalized version of strict n categories. Now, probably each of the words that I wrote so far, uh, unless you have studied them before, could deserve a lecture of their own or maybe even a course. And moreover, um, although Macquarie has probably the biggest category theory school in the world, if you are a different type of mathematician and you have different research interests, maybe you have never even interacted with the, the basic case of the, the ones that I am discussing so far. So by no means my intention is in 45 minutes to give you a complete account on any of those things. And instead I'm hoping to um, give you some ideas of what we mean when we talk about higher structures. And maybe the one little uh, um, idea that you can start having in mind and can remember after the talk is that whatever categories are, they're going to be some type of algebraic structure based on axioms. And we are mathematicians and we know and love axioms and it's something we uh, know how to deal with. So for instance, one axiom that occurs in the definition of a category looks like this, H composite G composite F, where we put the brackets here, must be equal to H composite G composite F with a different type of bracketing. And if this looks to you like uh, uh, the condition of associativity of composition, this is definitely not a coincidence. And what is, um, what happens, what we might acknowledge is that there are situations where this axiom almost holds, except that the two members are not equal on the nose, but there is some sort of higher isomorphism between them. So instead of this axiom, we are gonna find some H composite G composite F being isomorphic in some sense to H composite G composite F. This isomorph is going to be some alpha and well, we don't know what it is right now, but in examples, uh, we will, it will be apparent what type of isomorphism I'm talking about there. And although I'm being very vague right now, uh, maybe we already have one main take out from the talk that when going from the left to the right column, we are substituting something that is a property to something that is now a structure. Okay, so um, if you allow yourself to change your viewpoint and maybe incorporate in your way of thinking some of those ideas, then this is also what, um, what goes into the basic ideas of new directions in mathematics or even like fields 
that arise from more classical or existing ones. So for instance, um, higher category theory are very crucial in the development of derived algebraic geometry from uh, maybe more classical algebraic geometry. And uh, higher category theory tools are also useful to enrich the maybe more ordinary theory of not invariance and instead do categorified not invariance. And if you are someone who does like TQFTs and likes to study field theories, maybe in the sense of Batia or Siegel, uh, then if you have at your disposal a well, uh, like well established higher category theory, then this will also help you formalize fully extended field theories. And fully extended field theories, for instance, are those that occur in the formulation of the cobordism hypothesis. And finally, in this, if instead you do maybe more like logic or computer science, as opposed to the more traditional type theory, which is based on set theory, if you allow yourself to know a bit of higher category theory, you can instead do homotopy type theory, which is sometimes referred to as hot. And I'm not an expert in any of those mathematical directions, but I am mentioning this because um, I, I hope that this is a supporting claim that whatever progress uh, I or you or anyone makes in higher category theory is going to be beneficial for a lot of uh, directions that are of independent interest. And great, so maybe we do want to try and understand higher category theory. And the problem is that there is something very peculiar to this field. So mathematicians are very used to generalizing notions, but for this particular case, uh, it's hard to generalize stuff. Even when you start with a concept that you understand very well, when you start with a definition that is really well formulated, it's not always clear how to generalize. And so this leads to the uh, maybe question or problem of having different models for the same thing and understanding how they compare. So here I'm going to fill this box by saying that when you do higher category theory, one difficulty is that definitions often can be formalized in many models. Okay. So I, this is a bit of like just trailer, I guess. Uh, and now we can start. And as I said, maybe you are not familiar in general with what a, an ordinary category is, even before we start introducing higher structures. And this is the, probably the definition that you would find in McLean's book. And what is a category? So a category C is going to consist of a bunch of structure and uh, or yeah, I'm gonna start with the first bit, which requests that C has a set of objects. So those objects, maybe we denote them with capital letter, A, B, C, and so on. And then I wanna have a set of morphisms between those objects. So the cartoon for this is that a morphism is gonna be some F that goes from an object to another object. For instance, I have an F from A to B. And I could also have some G from B to C. And I want to be able to compose those morphisms whenever they are consecutive. So I want to have a composition law for, one, for morphisms. And this is just requesting that whenever I have two morphisms that present this configuration, then I must be able to produce a new one that goes from A to C. And we denote it with the usual uh, composition notation. So this is uh, maybe the type of structure that we want. Uh, but there are going to be uh, conditions on this composition law. And what we request is that this composition law, which is an operation, has to be unital and associative. 
And I'm not going to uh, say much about uni what UNITAL means. I'm going to ignore it for most of the talk, but essentially it requests that for every object A, I have something that behaves like an identity. And instead I want to put more attention on the associativity axiom, which is the one we encountered before. So whenever I have not two, but three consecutive morphisms, uh, I want to be able to compose them by putting the bracket either way and obtain a, the same result. So associativity is going to request that H composite G composite F with this bracket is the same as H composite G composite F with a different bracket. Okay, so this is the definition of a category and maybe it looks familiar. And if it looks familiar, it's because if you did an undergraduate like uh, degree in math, you have encountered plenty of categories. And roughly speaking, you have encountered one category in each first level course that you took. So for instance, uh, if you did an introduction to proof uh, course or a logic proof, most likely you have worked in the category of sets where the objects are exactly sets. And as the notation suggests, the morphisms are just going to be old school boring functions between sets. And composition is just the usual composition of function. And if this was just to talk about sets, maybe we didn't need to uh, bother to go to a more abstract setup. But actually the same structure like occurs in many different flavors, as I said, in several courses that you took. So for instance, in all algebraic, um, in all courses that you took about a specific algebraic structure, groups, rings, modules, or I don't know, vector spaces, uh, then you're gonna have that the objects are sets with the algebraic structure that we are studying. And in that case, the notion of morphism are going to be functions that preserve the type of algebraic structure that you're studying. So for instance, I am putting a representative example here. Uh, we have the category of groups where the objects are groups and the morphisms are group homomorphisms. And again, uh, there is nothing surprising because composition is the usual one. So nothing to be mentioned there. And instead uh, from my geometry courses where I study uh, topological spaces or manifolds with some adjectives, probably I worked in a category of spaces of some form. So for instance, in the category of topological spaces, the objects are going to be topological spaces and uh, the correct notion of morphism there are continuous functions. So, um, the fact that categories are like uh, so everywhere, I hope uh, it's already a convincing hint that uh, it will be ben very beneficial to know the language of uh, um, like know the language of category theory and being able to apply it in like many different uh, setups. And so this is what, it, what category theory does for us. It's category theory is the study of categories and it's good because it studies a category uh, in general, and it also studies how, how they interact with each other. So I have at least two uh, kind of independent advantages. Uh, first of all, if I prove a theorem about a generic category, then at once it will specialize to a theorem about sets, a theorem about groups, and a theorem about vector spaces, just with one proof. Or um, it's also, category theory is also useful if I want to formalize constructions that, um, for instance, implement algebraic invariants of geometric objects. And those can be encoded into functors that go maybe from the category of topological spaces into the category of maybe abelian groups. Okay, so um, I'm not going further with uh, trying to convince you uh, why category theory is great. And instead I want to take a detour and see what are certain circumstances that instead escape the ordinary category theory and will push us towards uh, finding new viewpoints. Is there any questions so far? Okay, so we're gonna have three running examples of situations that are 
disguised as categories uh, and something will go wrong. So the first example is, uh, I started with a topological space and here's my cartoon for it, X. And I'm pretty convinced that I can build a category out of this topological space where the objects are the points of my space X. So here's one object, here's one object, here's one object. And now a morphism, for instance, from X to Y, now is going to be a path in my topological space from X to Y. If you forgot what a path is, a path is a continuous function defined on the interval zero one and valued in X. So for instance, I'm drawing the, the trajectory of a certain path, alpha from X to Y, and here I'm drawing a path, the trajectory of a path alpha prime from Y to Z. Now, how am I supposed to compose those paths? And the uh, naive guess would be to just try and concatenate them. So if you have two continuous function defined on the standard interval, uh, so that the end point of the first one agrees with the starting point of the second one, you could define a concatenation and roughly speaking what you're going to do is that you're going to run over alpha but twice as fast than you would if you just did alpha and then after that you're going to run twice as fast over alpha prime than you would do if you only had alpha prime so if this is my interval zero one, and this is one half, I'm going to do alpha for the first part and alpha prime for the second. Okay, so this is the first uh, candidate example that is going to be a non-example. Now let's see the second one. Um, now the objects are going to be by, uh, given by these joint unions of finitely many circles. joint unions of finitely many circles. So this is what an object look like. It's it is joint union of two circles. And I'm putting this frame so that you don't think that those are two objects. I'm regarding them as one object. And here's another one. Now it's just one. Now a morphism between such objects is going to be uh, what is sometimes called a cobordism between them. And uh, um, to let you know what a cobordism is, I'm going to draw a picture. So a cobordism is going to be a two dimensional surface whose boundary is given precisely by, by M and N. So here's the prototypical cobordism that you would see on a board from M to N. It's called a pair of pens because it looks like one. And there it is. So this is the two dimensional surface. And if I want to be more exotic, I can at the hole there. So I recognize that this is from M to N because I see a copy of M in this part of the boundary and the copy of N in this part of the boundary. So this is going to be a morphism from N to N. And now uh, when it comes to composition, what I'm going to do is that I'm going to glue cobordisms together. So how does this work? I'm going to recycle an existing picture. 
So say we are in a situation where we already have the cobordism, the, the pair of pants with a hole from M to N. And then I have this uh, weird sweater that goes from N to, I don't know, Q, where Q is now going to be the object that has three circles. And now that I drew them in this way, uh, it's probably reasonably intuitive to say how I'm going to glue them. I'm just going to stick them next to each other along N, and then I'm gonna forget about N, and now I just have a single piece of clothing uh, that I'm gonna wear. And mathematically, I'm going to regard it just as a new cobordism from M to Q. Okay. And finally, the third example has a more algebraic flavor. And the objects are now algebras over C. You could also take just strings. And now a morphism is going to be a bimodule. So what is a bimodule? So say we have two algebras, A and B. And so a bimodule over A and B is going to be something that has a left action of A and the right action of B. And I'm going to regard this as a morphism from A to B. And how do I compose two such things? So suppose I have another one that goes from B to C. What does a morphism from B to C look like? Well, it's going to be, again, some M prime some vector space that has an action of B on this side and an action of C on this side. And I'm hoping to produce something that is now left with an action of A on one side and on C on the other one. And the natural thing to do is at this point to take the tensor product over B. So I'm going to take M tensor over B with M prime, which still receives the action from A on one side, still receives the action from B on the other side, and therefore I can regard it as a morphing from A to C. So it's nice that those examples are much more exotic than the categories that we have seen before. Like in the examples that we have seen before, objects were always sets with some structure, algebraic or topological, and morphisms were always function compatible with this structure. But in those examples, this is not true. In the first one, an object is just a point in space. It's not a set. And uh, a, a morphism in none of those examples, essentially, is a function. So they are of very different nature. And exactly because the nature is so different, uh, something is gonna go wrong. And they have a common issue in that in all those examples, associativity is only met up to something. So the common issue is that associativity of morphisms only hold up to a higher isomorphism. So let's try and make sense of this in at least one of those examples. So here I wrote for you what associativity would look like in each of the three examples if it was met. If it was met, I would expect to see an equality here where alpha, alpha prime, and alpha second are consecutive paths in my space X. Here, sigma, sigma prime, and sigma second would be three consecutive cobordisms. And here, M, M prime, and M second would be three consecutive bimodules. So if I'm hoping to put an equality here, I need to analyze uh, what is the difference between alpha alpha prime concatenated with alpha second and 
alpha concatenated with alpha prime alpha second. So let's zoom there a bit. So what is the cartoon? We said that we had X here. We have three points that we care about, actually four. And we have alpha here, alpha prime here, and alpha second here. We really get the impression that the, con the concatenation should be associative. Come on, look at the picture. And the picture is not capable of telling the issue, but the picture is not the full information about what the path is. The picture is only the trajectory that is drawn by a path. And um, if I want to convince you and highlight what is the difference between the two ways of concatenating them, uh, we can see what the difference is in terms of speed, essentially. So if we do alpha concatenated alpha prime concatenated alpha second, what we are doing is that we have our standard interval and we are using the second half of the time to run over alpha second. We are using the first quarter of the time to do alpha and the second quarter of the time to do alpha prime. Instead, with a different choice, namely alpha, alpha prime, alpha second with parentheses here, I would use the first half of my available time to do alpha, and then I would divide into parts the remaining to do alpha prime and alpha second. Now, those two things are almost the same, but they're not identical, and I need to acknowledge this. However, they are very similar, and the way to formalize the fact that they're very similar is that I could find a continuous reparameterization that deforms one of the two concatenation into the other one. And if you have ever taken an algebraic topology course, this picture will be familiar to you. So I have this reparameterization that kind of connects the two things that I'm hoping are going to be equal. And in technical term, the existence of this continuous reparameterization uh, is said to be that there is a path homotopy between them. So those two paths are connected by a path homotopy. So here we have experienced the first failure of, uh, of associativity, and we're gonna record this. So this is not an equality but there is a path homotopy connecting the two. Now, if you spend some time uh, trying to analyze what happens in the two other examples, uh, you will recognize that similar issues occur. So for instance, in the second case, you would find yourself comparing two different cobordisms that are not really equal. They're very similar, but they're not very equal. And the correct thing to say is that really they're diffeomorphic. So there is a diffeomorphism between them. And I guess you could also uh, observe that this diffeomorphism is boundary preserving. And finally, in the last situation, we are gonna find yourself comparing two uh, bimodules. They're not gonna be equal, but there's gonna be a canonical isomorphism of bimodules that links them. Is an isomorphism of bimodules. Okay. So this means that those categories are not categories. And our mood right now is that uh, it's like we've been living in a house forever and we just discovered that there is a paranormal presence, a ghost that has been around all the time. And now we are aware of it. And we need to decide how we're going to relate with this paranormal presence. And one thing that we could do is to try and lock this ghost in a room and try to continue our life in a way that is as normal as possible. Or instead, the second reaction that we can have is to try and get to know the ghost and kind of make the best out of this relationship. And we're going to see how uh, the two 
metaphorical strategies would translate into a mathematical approach. So the first reaction is, uh, OK, I really want to uh, stick to the theory that I have already developed of strict categories. So if each of those three is not an equality, but it's almost one, I'm just going to enforce that it becomes one. And how do I enforce that it becomes one? I'm just going to declare that path homotopy is equality or diffeomorphism of cobordisms is equality. And how do I do this? This is the same as saying that instead of saying that in the first example, a morphism would consist of a path alpha, now a morphism is going to consist of a homotopy class, namely a path, but up to path homotopy. And if I do this, then I have corrected the axiom that was going wrong because once I put homotopy classes, now this is an equality and associativity holds. And I can perform the same fix in the two other situations. So I can say that in the second example, a morphism is not just a cobordism sigma, but it's a cobordism up to diffeomorphism. And in the third example, a morphism is not just going to be a bimodal, but it's going to be a bimodal up to isomorphism of bimodals. And this is maybe the most instinctive fix that you would go after. And um, it's good for many purposes, because now you do get honest categories from the previous examples. And you can actually use the ordinary category theory that you know to do stuff with them. And I'm just pointing out that those categories are actually studied and have names. So for instance, the category that you would obtain from the first example uh, would be the fundamental groupoid of X. And if you know what the fundamental group of X is, this is something very related to it. And the second one would be the two-dimensional cobordism category. And I wasn't sure if the third one had a name, but someone told me that sometimes it's referred to as the Morita category. This is just to say, uh, those are categories of their own interest and they do make a lot of things work. However, I need to be aware that by making this choice, by uh, choosing the first strategy, I am throwing away willingly some information. And depending on what my purpose is, this might be bad. So for instance, in the first example, the example coming from the topological space, the first strategy kind of amounts to completely uh, disregarding higher homotopy groups of X. And if you don't know what a higher homotopy group is, maybe you can just think that I'm throwing away information about holes of large dimension in X. There could be an interesting geometry, interesting holes. I'm completely throwing this away. And in the, in the second case, uh, maybe one thing that I'm throwing away is that there could be an interesting moduli space of cobordism, and I'm completely disregarding it. So if my ultimate goal involves keeping track of this information, uh, I'm gonna have to uh, rethink my strategy and maybe decide that I need to embrace the presence of a higher structure and keep it. So in which way do I want to keep it? So this is the thing that we are after. So far, uh, our tower was a very small tower. It only had objects and morphisms. But now I want to encode in the structure this path homotopy. And what is the nature of it? It's going to be something that links a morphism to a morphism. So I want to allow in my structure to have 
morphisms between morphisms. And without much imagination, I'm just going to keep track of the dimension and call those two morphisms. And if I need, I'm going to call one morphisms, the previous ones, and zero morphisms, the objects. Now I could stop there if I wanted. However, uh, when I try to write down what are the axioms that two morphisms should satisfy, I might run into the same issue because I don't want axioms because axioms might not hold on the nose. I want to replace axioms with something even higher that is going to witness what used to be inequality. And so if I follow this philosophy, then what I should do is just never stop and have three morphisms and four morphisms and so on. So now the structure is very rich because I have objects. And if I have two parallel one morphisms, F and G, I may have a two morphism between them. And if I have two parallel two morphisms, I may have a three morphism between them. Then I will stop drawing because those errors are getting too fat, but this is the point. I never want to stop. I want to allow structure in each dimension. Okay, how do we make this precise? And Here's the first approach at making things precise, which is not going to be precise at all. So an infinity one category consists of objects that I regard as zero morphisms, but it also consists of morphisms in each dimension. So it has K morphisms, between k minus one morphisms. This is for each k. And I expect those morphisms to compose suitably. So that compose weakly. And if you're wondering where the parameter one is playing a role, it's playing a role in the request that those morphisms are invertible in dimension higher than one. So, and are invertible for K bigger than one. And so if you instead are trying to think about an infinity N category, then you're going to request invertibility for K after N. So this is not a definition yet, but it's an expectation that we have built after studying a bunch of examples. So for instance, the previous examples uh, can be organized into suitable infinity n categories. And a lot of other topics that people care about can be understood as functors of infinity n categories. So here are some things that can be understood uh, as functors of infinity and categories. We have fully extended field theories, which are useful in phrasing the cobordism hypothesis, as I mentioned before. Uh, we have a bunch of algebraic invariants of geometric objects that occur in algebraic topology. Uh, we have stacks and other things in derived algebraic geometry, and we have interpretations of homotopy type theory. And so again, since we have so many directions where we feel like, um, the theory would apply, we are really motivated to uh, develop a good theory of infinity and categories and functors between them. And so we are going to start asking ourselves then what is an infinity one category? What I have given you so far clearly is not a definition that would make it into a paper. It's more of an expectation. And as a matter of fact, there are many answers and uh, depending on who you ask, you may get different answers. So one way to go is uh, to follow uh, an approach that was widely developed by Joyal, but also other mathematicians, and to say that an infinity one category is a quasi-category. Now, maybe you don't know what a quasi-category is, but this is a well-defined mathematical object. And what does it look like? It's 
a simplicial set that satisfies a certain condition. And the technical condition, which I am not going to comment further on, is that inner horns have pillars. And it's not immediate, even if you go and look up what the definition of inner horns of fillers means, it's not immediate if you haven't spent some time thinking about this, why these should uh, implement the concept that we are after. But we do get the intuition that we do have higher structure present in a simplicial set. Because the way that we picture a simplicial set is something that has a bunch of vertices bunch of edges between them and a bunch of triangles and maybe some tetrahedra or even higher uh, dimensional triangles. And we do have an intuitive dictionary that we can use and recognize that this looks like a category if we pretend that vertices are going to be um, objects. Morphisms, sorry, edges, are going to be one morphisms and triangles and tetrahedra and higher dimensional things are going to give you the higher structure. And I'm not going to develop this theory for you. It's um, like, it's not easy, it requires a lot of work. And if you want to know more, you can read 1000 pages in higher topos theory. But the point is, this is now a well-defined mathematical object. Everyone who does homotopy theory loves simplicial sets. However, you may have a different response. And you can instead say that an infinity one category is a topological category. So this is something that kind of lives in a different universe. It lives in a, in an enriched category theory context. And so it consists of objects and it's almost like a category between objects I have morphisms, but now I put a topology there. So I have a space of morphisms between objects. So again, uh, you can invest some of your time in trying to understand why this definition is implementing our expectation for an infinity one category. But we do recognize that the fact that there is a topology on the space of morphisms is going to allow us some um, the existence of higher structure. And instead, what I want to point out is that we could be having a debate where each of us expresses an opinion on which definition is better. And here I just wrote like two somehow very superficial reasons. Uh, for instance, that you may want to work with quasi categories because there is a developed literature, or you may prefer to work with topological categories because there it's very explicit how to compose one morphisms, which is less the case in quasi categories. And I could make a very long list of pros and cons for each of the two models. Um, but maybe I don't wanna choose. So the situation in which we are now is that we have kind of two um, concurrent providers for the same service. And depending on our needs, depending on what we want and try to prove, we really want to have both of them uh, at our disposal. And so some people are going to keep develop the theory on one side and some people on the other side. And that's great. Uh, but then in addition to that, we need to make sure that the two approaches are consistent with each other. So it is really important that we're gonna have some translation, some dictionary, some way to compare the two different approaches. And here is what the prototypical comparison theorem in higher category theory would look like. So uh, here I'm just mentioning one uh, and I'm being very sloppy in the way that I'm going to phrase it, uh, but you could deduce it by combining the work by uh, many different mathematicians. So here I'm mentioning some of them, Dreyal, Bergner and Lurie, and this is the way it goes. So you could 
put together all of quasi categories. And this is going to be itself an infinity one category. This is going to be the infinity one category of quasi categories. If you have dealt with, with category theory before, it should not surprise you that when you collect everything with the given structure, maybe you're gonna end up with having something that has a similar structure. And I could also uh, do a similar thing and collect together all topological categories, which was my second approach. And again, obtain the infinity one category of topological categories. And now the way uh, that the theorem would go is that those two infinity one categories are equivalent. So there is an equivalence of infinity one categories between the infinity one category Q cut and the infinity one category top cut. Now, maybe at first glance, this looks a bit like circular statement because it's confusing that this is meant to be the category of infinity one categories in one form and it's itself an infinity one category, but this is not a circular statement. You can make sense of this and very often uh, the, the technique that is used to prove this type of theorem is uh, model category theory, but there are also other ways. And such theorem is, or such type of theorem is great because now we have a more or less explicit way uh, to go back and forth. And we can recycle a theorem that someone has proved in one context and push it to the other one, or a construction that is maybe easier in, on one of the two sides and push it to the other one. And um, I was going to conclude just mentioning uh, what are the type of questions that maybe are generally, um, you would generally try to address in the field. And we have obviously only just scraped the surface of everything. We have only talked about infinity one categories, not in details. We have only talked about two models that are many more, uh, but still we did get a sense that there is this issue that uh, there are many ways to make sense of the same concept. Uh, you need to try and understand how they compare and you want to have a, a good um, a record of what are the good and bad properties of each of them so that at each point you're gonna choose which one you want. And these are precisely the directions that uh, are, I guess, in general considered interesting developing the theory of infinity and categories in a given model or build examples of infinity and categories in a given model and study how different models compare. And so as I said, uh, yeah, I'm done. <laughs> no, 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 you go on. Now. I think it's last sentence, is it? As I, uh, yeah, it was the last sentence. I was gonna mention that uh, uh, the state of the art is very different depending on the value of N. And when N is zero or one, the situation, these type of questions are mostly understood. When n equals two, uh, that's a ground that is being explored very much right now. And some people that are in the audience today work on this and uh, part of my work is also on this. And when n is bigger than two, then there's still a lot to explore and many like large open questions of the fields happen there. Yes, um, this was the last sentence. Thank you, Martina. Uh, thank you, such a, a nice ending. But uh, it's question time now. Please unmute yourself and you are welcome to ask a question or two. We have time. Actually, I might not know many things about uh, lower categories even. Uh, I remember vaguely from my uh, studies at the uni, but um, the continuity by N, does it make any sense? Um, I just 
uh, out of curiosity, is there any embedding type of um, property? What do you mean the continuity? When by? n increases, like, um, do you get it like a subspace or how do they relate? Uh, yes, yes. In general, the, the structure is increasingly complicated and anything that is an n category, strict or weak or higher or whatever, is also an n plus one. That, that you mm -hmm. have a way to regard it as an n plus one. And yeah, but things become generally more complicated when n increases. Yes, but the theory should, uh, the theory for n plus one should completely recover and extend the theory for n. n yes, okay, there is inventing property. Yeah. Um, now this is going to sound like a bit of a Dorothy Dixer, but uh, how high can, uh, what high values can n take? Can it go all the way to uh, infinity? Uh, not sure what you're asking. Are you asking oh, I, about the infinity categories? Yeah, yeah, I'm just uh, setting you up to mention those really. Uh, yes, uh, the situation is more subtle there uh, because there are different choices that you can make that lead to non-equivalent models. And uh, yeah, I think this is also something that is not completely explored, but yeah, I would say there are at least two possibly three non-equivalent ways of dealing with infinity infinity. And one is Dom's approach. Do you have a Any favorite, oh, mm -hmm. sorry. Do you have a favorite model for infinity n categories? I like completion sets. Uh, yeah, I mean, the completion sets which we have not talked about are one specific model of infinity and categories. And uh, one advantage that they have is that the complexity does not go crazy as much as for higher models when n increases. But it has some disadvantages in that things that should be small are not as small as you would expect when you're trying to work with them, like the nerve of the two cell. Hey, Martina, uh, great talk. Um, so question, um, when higher models of, uh, so models of higher categories fail to be equivalent, um, is there some underlying theme or intuition as to why they're failing to be equivalent? I mean, so far, when you call two things models for the same thing, it's, I mean, I mean, I don't know, other people may have different opinions, but uh, my impression is that if I'm going to say that those two things are a model for blank, then either it has been proven that they are equivalent or it's widely conjectured and believed and eventually someone is going to prove it. So we don't have, I think, so many examples of things not being equivalent. But yes, when they are not, I guess you should find a reason about why they are not. And uh, yeah, so you could... I don't know, like if you wanted to prove the two things were not equivalent, you could observe that um, two things that are equivalent in one model are not in the other one, and that's bad. Yeah, I don't have a more concrete example than this, but for instance, the infinity infinity categories that we mentioned a moment ago, uh, there are two models that are not equivalent and there is a conceptual understanding of why they are not and they should not be equivalent. One is a local, like a non-trivial localization of the other one. Yes, sorry, this was a bit of a technical vague answer, so I'm not sure if it addresses what you were asking. So the short answer is, I think that there should be a, a conceptual understanding if they're not equivalent. Cool, thanks. Yeah. And uh, I'll conclude today's session by this. You may contact uh, Martina at any time, I suppose, if you have any further questions. And uh, um, may I wish you all a happy break. Uh, in another piece of information, please not to forget, we resume our um, Zoom OQMs on 23rd of April. That is first Friday when 
we um, are back uh, from break to uh, work. So um, happy break, everyone. And thank you, Martina, for such yeah, a thank you very much. Uh, lovely um, talk. Have a good day, I guess. For me, it's a night, but yeah. Yeah, good excellent night. talk. Yeah, thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Martina. Thanks. Bye.